The Australian Grand Prix is over and the winner of the Grand Prix was Max Verstappen, but whilst this sounds boring and somewhat repetitive, the race was anything but that. The race was filled with multiple incidents and reliability has once again reared its ugly head for one of the top teams. But the question is, what did we learn and what can the data tell us about the Grand Prix? Well, that is what I'm going to be looking at today as we analyse the data from the Australian Grand Prix and what did we learn before F1 heads into the April break. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. The majority of viewers are not currently subscribed to the channel and if you're one of those, I would greatly appreciate it if you just tapped that little sub button. Now, let's get into the video. And don't worry, I will get into the top teams in a little while, so stick around for that. But let's start with the first thing from the Grand Prix, and that is the tyre wear. Or more like the lack of tyre wear. Tyre wear in Australia was virtually non-existent, and the race was pretty much a zero-stop Grand Prix due to the FIA throwing a red flag because of Alex Albon crashing out of the race. This gave everyone pretty much a free pit stop, and during the race, all the drivers were able to go faster and faster on the hard tyres. I had a feeling this might happen due to what we saw in practice and qualifying where the drivers were able to do lap after lap on the soft compound tyres. This low tyre wear was the same as what we saw in last year's Grand Prix. Now, I know the graph shows a total of 53 pit stops, but probably about 48 of those tyre changes was done during red flags. With a lap one safety car, we saw Sergio Perez go off the hard tyres onto the medium tyres and then a lap later come back into the pits again to put those same hard tyres on, meaning that Red Bull were intending for Perez to do the entire Grand Prix on the hard compound tyres and let's be honest, they probably would have been able to do this easily I imagine. One team that surprised me in the Grand Prix was the McLaren team. Yesterday I mentioned how McLaren was painfully slow in Australia during qualifying, especially in a straight line, and I said I would be very surprised to see them score any points. Well, not only did they score points, they managed to leap themselves up from 10th in the Constructors to 5th place, with Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri having an incredible race and incredible finishing position. But during the Grand Prix itself, there was one thing that was obvious. Overtaking for the McLaren was very challenging when compared to their rivals. Quite a few people were able to blast past their rivals, either into the Turn 9, Turn 10 chicane, or on the run into turn 11. But for McLaren, overtakes were not so easy and they were only just alongside their rivals when going into turn 11. But it did mean we got to see some great racing, especially between Norris and Hulkenberg in the Haas. Whilst this was a great result for McLaren, we cannot deny the fact that McLaren were struggling. And without the mayhem that happened on the second red flag restart, McLaren probably would have scored about two points at a maximum, but they did manage to maximise what happened around them. Alex Albon was another driver that actually impressed me in the beginning phase of the race, even if his race didn't last very long. As I mentioned in my qualifying analysis video, Albon in the Williams was running very low downforce, which is why he was so fast in Sector 2 during qualifying. However, this low rear downforce configuration backfired during the race very quickly. On lap 7, Albon lost the rear end of his Williams, hit the wall, and was out of the Grand Prix. As this graph shows in the opening phase, Albon was just going faster and faster as the tyres were coming up to temperature and giving him more and more grip. This gave him more confidence as well as grip to push harder, and I imagine on lap 7, he pushed the Williams car just a little bit too hard and lost the rear end. This is a consequence of the Williams teams running very low downforce and, well, Williams in general just lacking downforce. But thankfully for Albon, he was okay. It's just a shame that he lost some potential good points here today. For Alpine overall in the Grand Prix, they were the fastest midfield team, as this graph shows. I have a feeling Albon could have featured highly upon this list if he didn't bin the car, but he of course did bin it, but why was Alpine so fast as well? Well, the Alpine was another car that had incredible top speed today when using the DRS, essentially because they have a very efficient package when using the DRS, so they were able to go faster than their rivals, similarly to Red Bull. This meant that Gasly was able to stick with the Ferrari of Carlos Sainz, and he was actually able to go faster 
after Carlos Sainz had passed him. This graph here shows us the lap times throughout the race between Carlos Sainz and Pierre Gasly. Note that Sainz overtook Gasly on lap 25, but after then, Gasly and Sainz had very similar pace, despite the fact that Sainz was much faster than Gasly when Sainz was behind Gasly. This straight line efficiency of the Alpine puts them in similar contention as the Red Bull this weekend, which is why, as this graph shows, Gasly's teammate Ocon was able to clock the second fastest speed through a speed trap all race long, only second behind the Red Bull of Sergio Perez. Alpine can take a lot of confidence from this going forward for the next race in Baku. With the very long pit straights, they should be in a fantastic position to be the fastest midfield team, provided of course their two drivers don't take each other out. Now, what about the top four teams? Well, let's start with the Ferrari. On the face of it, Ferrari had an absolutely shocking Grand Prix. Leclerc crashed on the first lap with Lance Stroll, and it was Leclerc's fault. And then Carlos Sainz essentially instigated the big crash that we saw on the second red flag restart at the end of the Grand Prix, and Ferrari walked away from this race with zero points, which, yeah, you know what, I admit, it sounds shocking. But for Ferrari, this was actually their best race in terms of pace all year long. Not only was the pace strong, but for the first time this year, Ferrari were actually impressive on the hardest compound of tyre. In Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, Ferrari really suffered when bolting on the hard compound tyres, as of course this graph from Bahrain shows where they went from being the second fastest to the fourth fastest car when using hard tyres. But this weekend, Sainz was able to extract a lot of pace on those hard tyres, and in fact he was overall the second fastest car, as this graph shows, only just behind the Red Bull rocket ship. For Ferrari, they can take a lot of confidence away from this race going into the April break. They had brilliant straight line speed, and to indicate this, I've taken the fastest lap of the Grand Prix from Hamilton, Alonso, and Sainz. And as the telemetry data shows us, Sainz's straight line speed was something to behold when compared to Alonso and Hamilton. But I know what you might be thinking, but Pulse, what if Sainz was using DRS? Well, I've also included the DRS in the telemetry as well, and it shows us that neither driver was using DRS. This basically shows us Ferrari could be heading into Baku with a lot of confidence that their car will suit that circuit with that straight line speed. We saw this in Bahrain and Saudi too, but finally, they were able to consistently have good race pace. Hopefully next time though, they can at least score some points. Next up is both Mercedes and Aston Martin. I've decided to lump these two together as there was absolutely nothing to tell between Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso. As the telemetry here shows us, Alonso and Hamilton were trading fastest laps all race long between the pair of them, and they were just able to go faster and faster. The lack of any tyre wear this race meant that Aston Martin's biggest advantage in the Grand Prix, which is that they're able to look after their tyres, was pretty much null and void. Had George Russell not been screwed over by the first red flag, followed by, of course, him breaking down, then I believe we probably would have seen both Mercedes cars finishing on the podium today. For Mercedes, this race was a massive positive. However, once again, with the Mercedes-powered car, we saw some reliability issues. In Saudi Arabia, it was Lance Stroll, and this weekend, it was George Russell, who had some reliability issues. This is going to be a concern for Mercedes going forward, especially going into Baku, when Baku is one of the bumpiest races of the year. It seems that no team or manufacturer this season is safe from reliability issues. And finally, let's talk about Red Bull, as once again they were the class of the field with their straight line speed efficiency. It's once again unmatched by anyone else in the field. For Max Verstappen, the win would have been trickier had Mercedes not boxed Russell and if he kept on going instead of course breaking down. When this was happening, Mercedes were able to hold off Max Verstappen, at least for now. Of course, Max was probably just not using overtake. But... He was behind them as Lewis was given slipstream and DRS with George Russell in front. But as soon as Russell was out the way, Verstappen flew past Hamilton with ease and didn't look back. 
Perez was able to fly through the field as well, pulling off some very brave overtakes into the fast chicane. So for Red Bull, once again, there's nothing else to say. They were incredibly dominant today. And had Perez not started from last and probably been screwed over by some red flags, he could have probably gotten into the top five. So what did we learn from the Grand Prix? Well, when Ferrari make their hard tyres work for them, they have a great race car and potentially can be the second fastest car overall. We saw it in Bahrain and we saw glimpses in Saudi Arabia, but this weekend they were able to pretty much show that they were the second fastest race car. Williams need to put some downforce on their car. They have brilliant straight line speed, but that lack of rear downforce is going to bite them in the backside more than once this season. We could see it be an issue potentially going into Baku as well if they lose the rear end at a difficult point on the circuit. Alpine, in terms of pace, is overall moving forward and based on previous races, is now probably the fastest midfield team. And Pirelli need to take a step softer tyres to Melbourne next year because that was a little bit too boring in terms of tyre wear. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you did, as always, comment, leave a like, and subscribe for more F1 content. Thank you all so much for watching.